Good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Peter Bates. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at the Royal London Hospital with Paul and Parviz. And uh, trauma doesn't really lend itself to private practice. So I don't do like things like hip and knee, hip and knee replacements. So in order to get a little bit of extra money, I do, I do medical reports. So this is my sort of, uh, this is my dark side, if you like. Um, and uh, I understand but we've got a lot of lawyers in the in the audience, which is great. So I, I, I just want to be wary. I, I'm not, I don't want to tell you stuff you already know, um, but I'm just I, I just for completion, I'm just going to frame the situation so that everyone knows where we where we stand on this. If you have an injury, any injury, any bad injury, uh, your juice and compass, if, and it's not your fault. So someone, you're driving along and someone crashes into you and you're really badly injured. You are due some compensation, probably by their insurance company or whoever it happens to be. But there are two fundamental problems, and here they are. Number one, there is a mismatch between what the law says and what the NHS can deliver. So that's what the law says. The, the claimant, the victim, is entitled to be put in the position that he or she would otherwise have been in had they not been subject to the breach of duty insofar as the damages can do so. In other words, as much as money can buy, we're going to try and put you back as close as we can to how you were before. But the NHS can't deliver that. The NHS can get you back pretty close. We can treat you very well acutely, but actually the rehab and a lot of the specialist stuff and the, uh, the rehousing and the, uh, the equipment that's required really isn't provided to the same extent. So what ends up happening is that that has to be delivered by the private sector. The other problem, of course, is the actual raw compensation. I don't actually know who the JSB are, but I understand they are an important body and they have guidelines. And one of the common uh, ones that is quoted to me is this one. So if you lose both of your arms, you are due some compensation. And the, and the compensation for that is less than a quarter of a million pounds. Imagine that. You have both of your arms chopped off, and all you're going to get is a quarter of a million pounds. That's For the rest of your life, that's your lot. And so actually, the way the British system works is that your compensation doesn't come from that figure there. It comes from all the other stuff. So anything else, any other compensation you get, has to be specifically justified. And that's why uh, medical uh, uh, experts are required, because that extra money, the justification for those, comes out of your prosthesis, your equipment, your treatment, any treatment that's required, any uh, changes to your accommodation that are needed, any loss of earnings, any care requirements which may ramp up as you get older. So that just frames the situation of where you stand as a medical expert, or particularly when someone gets amputated, those are the things that I guess you guys are wanting to see inside that report. There is a third problem, and this is it. We are besieged. Besieged is a total... No, that's, that's, that's the wrong word. We are strongly exposed nowadays to amputees who are extremely high-functioning. This is Oscar Pistorius, as you all know, and things didn't go so well for him. <laughs> but he was the first Blade Runner, wasn't he? He was the first guy that made Blade Running like a thing. And I remember really distinctly like looking at this guy, watching him on his blades, thinking, shit, that's so unfair. Like, how are the guys who haven't got blades on going to, like, how are the guys with legs going to cope against that guy? And of course, now it's commonplace. We have the we have the uh, Paralympics. We have the um, uh, what's that thing uh, uh, Harry does? Uh, the, the, the Invictus Games. Uh, so we're 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 seeing these amputees at a high level of athleticism. Um, we're seeing we're seeing all sorts of other things. The media is full of other things, like whether it's riding your BMX and doing stunts on that with a high above knee, uh, or climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, or. Uh, Rowing across the Atlantic with your buddies, or flying across America with no arms, or just hanging out in your pants, <laughs> looking buff. <laughs> Whatever it is, there are a lot of... We are led to believe this isn't such a bad deal. 
it's not such a bad thing. Actually, being an amputee, you can be like super amazing. I, I don't actually know what's going on in this picture, but anyway, you, you can read your own interpretations, but we are, we, we are exposed to this a lot. But actually, in reality, in reality, what are the functional norms of a lower limb amputee? That's the killer question. And I, I, I need to just clear up this one as well. There is a big difference between military amputees and civilian ones. Not because they're, they're, they're not human beings, they, they're, they're, they're similar people. The military amputees tend to be a bit younger, they're fitter, they're very strongly motivated, and they've got a lot of, I guess you call it corporate security. They've got a lot of, you know, the, the, the military look after them. They look after them, they throw all the te possible technology of them, and they've got a bunch of buddies who are also amputees that they can hang out with, chew the fat with, and discuss things with. So, and when you're in a, in a civilian situation, you don't have any of that. You may get some of the technology, but not all of it. If you want buddies who've had, have had amputations, you can go and find them, they're out there, but they're, they, they may not be your cup of tea, and you may not have a great deal in common with them. So, um, as an amputee, as a civilian military, very different. So, what are the functional norms of amputees? And I, I've, I've got my, my evidence mainly from these uh, these four sources, but uh, there's a ton of information out there. Uh, there's a big uh, this guy. Oopsie, sorry. It sometimes does that. There's a uh, there's a big. Uh, oh, okay. There we go. There's this big uh, 3,000 patient meta-analysis up here, uh, looking at 27 studies, uh, which was recently, oh, it's actually 2011. So some of the data is a little bit old. And when you're doing a big, when you, when you pull data, so you take like, like 20 studies, for example, and you pull all the data, and you're right, now I've, I've got all these patients, you know, each study's got like 100 patients in, but you take 20 of them, so now you've got a huge bucket load of patients, and then you, and then you can do some analysis on that. The only trouble with doing that is that a lot of those studies you pull together are quite old. And so big meta-analyses of this type can be a little bit misleading because they don't necessarily give you the absolute up-to-date picture. Anyway, there are two very, very common themes across the whole patch is that function is better in below knee than it is above knee. And that's across all functional measures. There are also high rates of physical disability and psychosocial disability across the whole patch. Doesn't matter what level your amputation is, that, those are very, very strong themes. And these are the things I want to talk about um, in relation to that. So, physical function. What's it like? Well, uh, down here you've got baloney here, the TKA's through knee amputation. And this is above knee amputation here. And you can clearly see that across the meta-analysis, it's better to be below knee than it is to be above knee. There used to be a thing about through knees not being a very good idea because that functionally weren't great. And that, the reason what for that was is because the prosthetists were really struggling to produce prostheses that, that worked well through knee. Now we're much better at that. And now a through knee is widely regarded as better than an above knee. So it's Below, through, above, in terms of function. But your doesn't matter, even you've got the highest, um, incredibly high functioning baloney amputation, not osseointegrated, but you know, normal one, you still have, uh, your physical function is still reduced. Yeah, the top, the top score up here is 100. Like most of the guys in this room will be like 90 plus. And most of these guys are averaging that down at 60 in terms of your physical function. Disability increases with higher amputation levels, as we say, uh, and there's reduced quality of life across all amputees. That is a stat given thing. Ability to walk more than 500 yards. Yeah? Only seven, even your, even your below knees, even the really good ones, only 72% can walk more than five, that's half a kilometer, that's nothing. Only, only like three quarters of them can walk that distance. Symptoms of pain. Well, there's various different types of pain. You've got phantom pain, really common. It does, it does ebb, normally it ebbs off over time, but beyond the two or three year mark, it kind of plateaus off and it remains fairly steady. Um, 
Residual limb pain. What I mean, uh, a stump is often called a residual limb. They're, they're like, they're, they're the same, means the same meaning. So residual limb pain is basically a painful stump. There are lots of reasons for a painful stump. You can either have a, a neuroma, one of those nerves that uh, uh, Prof. Branamark was talking about, one of those nerves which is kind of, you cut it and then it gets angry, and it, like it's all swollen up and hypersensitive. So every time it gets touched, you get this like, oh, searing pain going up your leg or down your leg. Uh, you've got a poor fit, or if you've got some kind of infection going on. So unfortunately, an amputation stumps are very, very susceptible to deep infection. Right at the time when they get, not, not, not once they've healed, but before they healed, they, they often, often have problems with infections. So deep, indolent infection can be a, a cause for uh, uh, problems. And of course, if you have it, you know, the soft tissues over the top, the, remember, these are traumatic amputations. So these are people who've been hit by something and their legs almost been ripped off. And so often the soft tissues, and by that I mean the muscles and the skin overlying the stump, are often really bad quality. And you heard uh, your one we had, had a skin graft over the front of it. That's really, really common. Skin grafts don't take force well. They're not a good load-bearing surface. Back pain, we heard about that as well. 50 to 80% of amputees get some degree of back pain, with uh, above knees being very much worse and contralateral knee pain. So it's the actual, your amputation is on this side, but because you're like favoring the other side so much, you end up getting knee pain on the contralateral side. Again, incredibly common. So look at that, your age match controls, 20% of people are having con, you know, knee pain just as, as like one of those things. In below knee amputations, it's double that. In above knee amputations, it's kind of around about the triple that mark. Return to employment. Uh, so you can see, uh, uh, even in the really high functioning ones, you know, the below knees, the ones, oh, they'll, he'll be fine, you've got a below knee amputation. Only three quarters are returning to work. Interesting though, isn't it? Now what they've done is they've pulled literature from across the, across the, 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 uh, the, the uh, world. So you can see in the USA, you've got uh, a really quite a poor return to employment, but actually in the UK, a lot of people do make it back. Which is interesting because actually our social security is better than in the US. So I, I don't quite understand that figure. But um, uh, it usually takes 12 months to get these patients back to work. Um, and the more, again, and, and obviously the more proximal your amputation, the lower your rate of return. Here's the point though they're not returning to the same work, they're returning to something completely different. The majority. The vast majority of people, unless they are coming straight from an office job, which is entirely sedentary, they are downscaling the level of physicality of their work. Amputees using sockets do not like standing up all day. They do not like having to walk long distances as part of, part of their normal job. They definitely don't be lugging stuff around all day, even in the really high functioning ones. Um, and they often need retraining for that. And some people, as you know, you've all got clients who, you know, they're quite hard to train. You know, they were, they were, they were born a builder. I've always been a builder and I'm going to be a builder. Oh, shit, I can't be a builder anymore. Well, your options can be pretty slim if you're not really uh, academically minded in the, in the sedentary role. Uh, psychological aspects, very easy for us, us bone doctors to, uh, to over, overlook this one, but it's huge. Um, more than half of amputee, amputees, I mean, everyone gets some kind of psychological response, but almost half, more than half, get a proper diagnosis. They're like, you know, the ICD-10, bang, you are anxious or depressed, you've got PTSD, you've got an adjustment disorder. Uh, and I, I got this from the uh, one of the papers above, regardless of the level of amputation, all patients experience similar frustrations and challenges that many found overwhelming, and the actual degree of impairment uh, more, sorry, yeah, I misread that, obviously. Uh, but um, yes, okay, I've got my, my amputation. I'm being chased by a dinosaur. Sure, I can run. Yeah, I can now run. But do I enjoy running? No. Am I lent to run? No. And actually, when I, when I try running, it's, it's really uncomfortable. Uh, but I wish I could run. And actually, if there wasn't a dinosaur ch chasing me, sometimes I just feel like I can't be bothered to put that prosthesis on in the morning. And we heard a bit of that earlier on as well. So there is a big feeling of sometimes being overwhelmed by this cumbersome thing that hangs off your leg. 
cardiovascular elements. Um, this is again something that I, I kind of I, I kind of ex discovered almost by doing the research for this this talk. Um, you're three and a half times more likely to get ischemic heart disease as an amputee. You're five times more likely to get an aortic aneurysm, and you're one point six times more likely to die of a heart attack as you as you get older. Um, and so I would counsel you to, to speak with your clients and, and say, you know, to, to try and avoid those risk factors. I know you've been a little bit overweight and you like smoking and stuff, but maybe now's the time to give that up because it has a big impact on you now that you are a different metabolic creature. So those are the big things, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know uh, functional things. Uh, but remember, there are a number of adverse elements at bad things which you can superimpose on top of an amputation which make things even worse. Neuropathic pain is a big one. So these are people, what I mean by that is people with either really troublesome phantom pain or you know like lightning bolts going down into your foot. There's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. You can rub their leg, you can jump up and down, it makes no difference. It's just there all the time. And sometimes we talk about pain, like as in like like ouch pain. But sometimes, if you've got like a foot, you haven't got a foot, but you've got a foot that you can feel that's constantly tingling and like like got pins and needles. It's not really pain as such as an ouch, but it's really distracting and troublesome and super annoying. Um, there's stump pain. There's infection. Um, and then, of course, there's the patient factors I was talking about earlier on, like if you're a smoker, if you've got low socioeconomic status, low self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the thing, you, you will know it when you see it, it's, it's your ability to basically think positive and think, yes, I can do this thing. I can, like, I can go out and, like, you know, I, yes, I can walk to the end of the room. It's that belief that you can do it, and, then you, and that helps you when you try and carry out that thing. Um, uh, a lot of people who have low self-efficacy think, ah, oh, God, it looks like a long way to the other end of the room. I'm really not sure about this. And that affects your ability to do it and your willingness to do it, of course. So, taking you back to this diagram I showed you earlier, I'm just going to walk you through this. I'm going to avoid uh, this box over here because you're going to hear about that later on. Um, but the big thing is that this is a multidisciplinary exercise and you need other experts involved when you're preparing a report for the, you know, preparing a case for these things. You've got to have a prosthetist, you need some physicians involved and you need a rehab, a rehab group, uh, probably with, uh, overseen by a case manager as well. And what do the physicians look like? Well, okay, an orthopod, great. You probably need a pain expert unless there really is no sign of neuropathic pain. A plastic surgeon, if there's any sniff of soft tissue problems, uh, or a cosmetic issue that could potentially be improved. Psychologists got to be in there and uh, uh, psychiatrist as well. Treatments. You kind of divide up like these. This is preparing your report. You're deciding what treatments are required now and what treatments might be required in the future. Uh, in my hands, uh, uh, rehab, rehab, rehab is usually the case in most people who had big injuries. They're always under rehabilitated because the NHS doesn't rehabilitate people very well, I'm afraid. Uh, we, 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 we do, we do, it's not that they don't get any rehab, it's just that it's not given with the same gusto that it is in other countries. Um, and then you've got your stump revisions. Uh, you know, do they re require surgery, for example, like a stump revision, proximalization? What I mean by that is where you, you have to, because the stump isn't working properly, you have to like shorten it a little bit more in order to make it function better. If you've got a neuroma, you need a pain guy, you need some sort of investigation, maybe you need an MRI scan to rule out infection uh, deep inside the bone at the tip of the amputation. Do you need some kind of psychiatric or psychological intervention? Do you need a pain intervention? So these are treatments that you need right now. And then there's treatments you might need in the future. And of course, uh, that's, you know, is this patient likely to require, is that, is that stump likely to break down in the future? And we know from the evidence that about 5% of amputations still have problem, like problematic infection at two years. So one in 20 patients, you just can't shift that infection. And those guys are probably going to need, a, you know, to move their amputation up. And so a baloney might actually do better to be turned into a through knee. Or, and, and so on. And then, of course, there's the thing of, are they a candidate for osseointegration? And that's what today's uh, seminar is all about. I've tried to peripheralize this because I was more talking about the, uh, the, 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 the quality and the functional uh, level of normal amputations. But nowadays, 
I think this has got to be in the mix. If you're writing a report on a baloney amputee, there has to be some comment upon, is this patient a potential candidate for osseointegration? Or might they become one in the future? It doesn't necessarily mean to have to be, yes, they are, or no, they're not, because actually that decision is made by the patient and a big MDT of people, including prosthetists, uh, someone like Professor Branamark, who's a, who's a surgical expert, a plastic surgeon, and, a, and an orthopedic surgeon, and maybe even a pain expert as well, all in the same room, along with your psychological side as well. So that's a big MDT discussion. But are they worthy of, of, of evaluation? I think that should be there in most reports nowadays. Accommodation, uh, single level accommodation. So uh, this is a big payout, of course. This is a big deal in most reports. If you can say, yes, this patient needs single level accommodation, what, what triggers that? Basically struggling with stairs. If you find stairs really difficult, then you're a candidate for this. Um, and so that's basically all above knee amputees. And some BKs as well, although you have to take it on a case by case basis. Some of them don't particularly struggle, but a lot of them do. And getting up and down the stairs quickly, um, what you were talking about of like getting out, getting out of bed and off to the toilet quickly can can be you know that, that can be a problem. And what's the effect of osseo integration on that? Can that be sped up? Could could, could your stair climbing be improved? Do, can I ask? Do you have stairs at home? Yes. And how do you find stairs with your with your osseo? Um, I'm twice as slow as everybody else, but actually fine. I'm You're fine. Um, I I like the rail. Right. But Right. And if I was to come to you and, and offer you single level accommodation of one sort or other, is that something you would leap at or do you quite like living upstairs? No, I just moved. I just moved house and uh, I bought a house upstairs. <laughs> there you go. But, um, but yeah, no, because I've got about. Yeah. Loss of earnings this is another big one. Uh, as I said, the majority of patients of amputees, uh, the majority of amputees do have to change their job uh, of some sort or other. And so they need re retraining to something less physical. And so they need careers advice, particularly the youngsters who've, who just like come out into the world and they're full of energy and suddenly their leg gets chopped off and they need to really have a major readjustment about their what, the, what their future holds for them. And that can be quite a long uh, process for them to readjust. Periods of stump pain. So you may have a, like one of those guys, we saw one of those guys at the Invictus Games or the Paralympians, they all get stump problems, I can tell you. They all have issues and they have rubbing and they have pain and it's a pain in the ass and it's like, oh God, no, there's not one of them that wishes they, you know, uh, thinks this is a great life and they're completely, you know, the amputation is completely benign. Uh, it affects everyone to, to a degree and every amputee at some point will have periods of stump pain. I would be interested to hear from John. I... So when I'm writing a report on an amputee, I normally say that four weeks in the year, uh, patients have, uh, below, say a baloney amputee would have difficulties with stump pain. Would you say that's realistic or do you think that's, it's more than that? Um, I'd say that's, that's very reasonable, I think. Um, yeah. And during that period where they're having stump pain, what would they be doing? Would they just be, oh, to hell with this, I'm going on crutches for a bit? Or would they just be cutting down their walking, uh, not going, you know, maybe taking a, a week off work to let it settle? I, I think you need to factor in that the chances are they will need to come off uh, their leg for a season, you know. For a period of time. For a period of time. Uh, yeah. On occasion. Yeah, great. What would the effect of osteointegration be on that and reducing down their time off work and their, their uh, yeah, potential functional outcomes and that, those kind of like annoying periods where you're stuck at home with, the, with this big ulcer on the side of your leg that, where the, 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 the thing is rubbed. And finally, care and aging. I haven't really, I haven't really got my head around this one yet because it's so difficult. Because what actually happens to elderly amputees? Um, they, they, we know they have an increased cardiovascular risk. We know that you know that they are higher risk of ischemic heart disease, etc. So they, and they do have a shorter life expectancy. And if they've got comorbidities like you know other bits of like renal failure or uh, high blood pressure, or whatever, that will obviously summate on top of that. Um, they are. They, they are going to have require walking aids sooner uh, and, they, uh, and, and more frequently and they do have a higher falls risk uh, as they age and they're less tolerant of the prosthesis that, as they get older. Um, John, can I hit you again? Tell me about aging um, amputees. Are they... Are they uh, yeah. it, it depends on the level, um, how active they were when they're younger. Uh, they will slow down. 
as they would if they were non amputees. So, um, yeah. I, mean, I, I have it in my head that there's there's a, like a, a, a sort of age range where amputees kind of go off their legs is, is a little bit of a, a loose term, but they become in, increasingly frequent users of wheelchair rather than uh, rather than donning their prosthesis. Uh, is that is that a thing or not really? Uh, I think that figure varies depending if you're working with claimant or defendant. That's right. Um, but not necessarily. They don't suddenly grind to a horse at 55 years old. Uh, but things do slow down, uh, and there may be less less problems in a sense because of that slowdown. They're not subjecting the stump to you know higher forces, for example. Um, but yeah, you, you do have to take that into account whether they're, they're having to use a. Uh, um, their arms or wheelchair transfers, things like that. So it depends very much on the level of complexity. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, and so I think that, you know, what's their their care requirement going to be like in the future? That is, as, as I said, that's that's a really tough nut to crack. And I think, you know, you're, as as, uh, as defence and claimant, you do tend to reach a position on that. So that's my talk. In summary, Levels of disability following amputation are high. They're higher than the media would have us believe. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're military or civilian. As a, as a medical expert reporting on, on this, you need to capture all those elements because they're all critical to the patient's final settlement. Um, and multiple experts are required for a single case. We all know that. Patient's employment is usually strongly affected, sometimes not, but usually. Um, and there are factors which spoil your function. And by that, I mean things like neuropathic pain, a painful stump, uh, a stump that's got poor soft tissues around it, or patient factors like you're a heavy smoker, you're a bit overweight, you are, uh, you've got other comorbidities going on, like you're very strongly diabetic or whatever, or poorly controlled hypertensive. And the effects of aging are important, but they're quite hard to, to capture in a, in a, in a nutshell. And we've heard today that osseointegration is now not so much an emerging technology, but an established technology. Um, and so I think as, as, as uh, legal people, you should be pushing your experts to at least make comment on this, if not say, should uh, some sort of uh, MDT appraisal be, be, be proposed for them. Thank you very much. <laughs>